This video is brought to you by Full Sail University. What's up guys, Michael here and today I'm ready to inspire a niche group of otherwise charming adults to write me ever more elaborate death threats. Welcome to part two of our exploration of Disney adulthood, where mouse ears are part of the lifestyle and reciting Hakuna Matata each morning is mandatory. Last time we looked at the scholarly debate over how we talk about fandoms like Disney and whether or not they qualify as religion. And despite the fact that it might make some scholars and all Disney adults very, very mad at us, we're gonna take it a step further today. We're going to examine the evidence for Disney operating as a religion. That means looking at the nuts and bolts of how the hypothetical Church of Mickey Mouse works and what its spiritual doctrine might entail. So buggle up for part two of this wisecrack edition on Disney adults. Is Disney a religion? But before we get into it, I wanna shout out this video sponsor, Full Sail University. Full Sail offers associates, bachelors, and master's degrees in the fields of technology, arts, media, and entertainment. And they just launched a new bachelor's degree in game, business, and esports, which can help students enter the industry from different perspectives, from game development to communications and marketing to competitive gaming itself. And this new major joins a roster of other cool fields of study, like film production, computer animation, sports casting, and web development. With Full Sail University's accelerated coursework, you can finish your degree in about half the time required at other colleges and universities. Plus, you can complete your classes and coursework online or in person at Full Sail's campus in Orlando, depending on what's right for you. Whatever model you choose, you'll get hands-on, real-world experience in the career path of your choice. Plus, Full Sail accepts new enrollments monthly, so you don't have to build your schedule around traditional semesters. To learn more about Full Sail University's new game, business, and esports majors, or any of their other degree programs, visit fullsail.edu slash wisecrack. That's fullsail.edu slash wisecrack. And now, back to the show. Remember our friend, religious scholar, Dr. Eichler Levine, whose passionate defense of Disney adults inspired this video series in the first place? Well, she's far from the first person to explore the possibility that Disney might constitute a modern day religion. Way back in 1934, author E.M. Forrester went so far as to argue that Mickey is everybody's God. Meanwhile, scholar Richard Fogelsong called Disney the Vatican with mouse ears. But in order to really determine if Disney is a full-blown faith, we first need to think about what makes something a religion to begin with. For our purposes, we're gonna use anthropologist Clifford Gertz's popular definition from 1973, which outlines five stipulations to define religion as one, a system of symbols, two, about the nature of things, three, that inculcate dispositions for behavior, four, through ritual and cultural performance, five, so that the conceptions held by the group are taken as real. Addressing the first piece, a system of symbols, look no further than Mickey Mouse himself, who has become a worldwide symbol of innocence. In the United States, market researchers have found he has a 97% recognition rate, making him more recognizable than Santa Claus. As cultural critic Henry Giroux notes, the cultural iconography of Disney renders it a purveyor of innocence and family fun. He adds that through its films, parks, and endless merchandising, Disney becomes a symbol for the security and romance of the small town America of yesteryear. From the iconic Cinderella's castle representing enchantment and dreams coming true to barbershop quartets strolling down Main Street USA, Disney is rife with symbolism, not unlike that of religion. They do some of this by operating as what DePaul University professor Michael Buddy might call symbolic predators. That is, appropriating existing imagery from traditional religions. Indeed, like the sun shining over Simba's kingdom, echoes of world religions appear throughout Disney properties. Take the concept of the circle of life, which is deeply rooted in Hinduism, according to journalist Mark Pinsky, or Snow White taking a bite from an apple like you know who. Heck, Pinsky points out that in Pinocchio, when Geppetto falls to his knees to ask an undefined deity for help, a fairy appears, conveniently decked out in the Virgin Mary's trademark shade of blue. Still, let's be clear. Explicit references are largely absent from Disney movies. This was intentional. Disney biographer Bob Thomas notes that Walt Disney made the strategic business decision to keep religion out of his films in order to make them marketable to the widest international audience. And yet, there's still an argument to be made for the second qualification for religion, about the nature of things. Disney movies may not feature an explicit god figure, but many have argued that Disney effectively poached a lot of Judeo-Christian ideology while scrubbing out the actual divinity stuff. 
As Pinsky explained back in 2004, there is relatively little explicit Judeo-Christian symbolism or substance in 70 years of Disney's animated features, despite the frequent, almost pervasive use of a theological vocabulary. Words such as faith, belief, miracle, blessing, sacrifice, and divine. It seems a contradiction portraying consistent Judeo-Christian values without sectarian or even godly context. The fruits without the roots. He points out that Disney effectively preaches the Protestant work ethic, minus the whole God thing, exemplifying the argument that hard work leads to upward social mobility no matter what. Echoes of the David and Goliath story frequently pulsate through the films, with the poor and downtrodden always eventually triumphing over the powerful and corrupt. As Pinsky summarizes, good is always rewarded, evil is always punished, faith is an essential element faith in yourself, and even more, faith in something greater than yourself, some higher power. Optimism and hard work complete the basic canon. Pinsky dubs this Disney ethos secular tunism, explaining that in place of God working his divine magic, Disney uses magical creatures doing magic magic. You know, fairies and fairy godmothers, genies and ice queens, sea witches and uh, land witches. In this way, scholar Kathy Murlock Jackson writes, magic becomes a way to empower the powerless just like God does in so many classic biblical stories. So part two pretty much checks out. Part three, inculcating dispositions for certain behaviors, we're gonna set aside for now and return to momentarily. So we've established that Disney essentially created and maintained a consistent system of symbols about the nature of things across its films, parks, and other products. But how are those messages imparted onto its believers? Well, as author Richard Corliss speculated in a 1988 issue of Time Magazine, Walt Disney's philosophy may as well have been the Jesuit credo of, give me a child before he is seven and he will be mine for life. Indeed, Disney said as much, declaring that, I think of a child's mind as a blank book. During the first years of his life, much will be written on the pages. The quality of that writing will affect his life profoundly. By his own logic then, Disney has been, for multiple generations, scribbling all over those blank minds, with children spending more time consuming Disney films than they do with organized religion. And of course, as many of us grow out of childhood and into our teens and adulthood, Disney is right there to accompany us on our journeys. Except this time with Jedis and superheroes and bounty hunters, until life gets so depressing that we need the talking animals again. And then we come to part four of our definition, ritual and cultural performance. By far the most salient place where the rituals of Disney consolidate is, of course, at its theme parks. According to Harper's Magazine's Index, an estimated 70% of Americans have been to one of them, which is probably the only thing 70% of Americans have in common. These larger-than-life locations are seen by some scholars as akin to sacred spaces, where visitors make a pilgrimage, not unlike that of Jews to Jerusalem, or Muslims to Mecca, or American Irish Catholics to the Guinness Brewery at St. James Gate, Dublin. Fittingly, Disney's parks are absent of the unholy banalities of real life, like litter, or swearing, or frowning. Religion scholar Mircea Iliadi describes the importance people of faith ascribe to so-called sacred spaces, i.e. places that seem to exist in a sacred time, that is when the world was young and Edenic. In these spaces, myth and ritual help worshippers by recalibrating life toward the divine, as scholars Eric Mazur and Tara Cota summarize in their book, The Happiest Place on Earth. Notably, as Drew points out, Disney too exists outside of time. Hell, Disney reportedly removed all alarm clocks from its hotels in 2016. More importantly, the parks have no references to the present, a few references towards the future, but mostly seem to exist in a past that somehow approximates Eisenhower's conservative America. That is, a time when the world was young. Indeed, Disney World was attracting the nostalgia of baby boomer parents long before it became the site of their millennial children's weddings. Missing, of course, is anything unpleasant about that era, like the Red Scare, or racism, or barbiturates. In Frontierland, the American frontier is mythologized as a place of courage and adventure, making the brutal genocide committed against native people on those lands a brief footnote. American history is further glorified and sanitized in places like the Hall of the Presidents, where ugly parts of history, like say, Watergate or Iran-Contra, are ignored as an animatronic Abe Lincoln in Christ-like glory returns to life. Historian Mike Wallace calls this commercialization of the past Mickey Mouse history, a narrative written without classes, conflict, or crime, a world of continuous consumption, a supermarket of fun, 
Innocence effectively becomes a magic eraser, cleansing history of its less savory moments. And these Disney narratives all come to life in its holy sites, where rituals like riding Splash Mountain or watching sunset parades down Main Street or getting your picture taken with the characters for a hefty fee all provide joy and catharsis. In these spaces, religious scholar Peter Gardella writes, magical beings like Tinkerbell and Mickey Mouse abound. And many shows imply that such beings might help ordinary people. Gardella calls this transtheism or the provisional acceptance of many gods with an implied underlying oneness. As with a religious service, your sense of possibilities for your life are expanded through promises of divine intervention, or at least the ear of a sympathetic fairy godmother. Giroud describes Disney as a privatized, homogenous, and risk-free city, whereas critic Elaine Rapping points out, no trace of anything non-commodified, non-simulated, non-regulated, non-smiley-faced is visible or reachable. As with other sacred sites, the sense of effortless magic is facilitated as much by what you don't see as by what you do. A tour of the Pope's bathroom might kind of ruin the vibe of the Vatican, after all. Similarly, there's a virtual absence of anything non-magical at Disney, most especially visible labor. Disney employees, sorry, um, we mean cast members, use underground tunnels to transport food, products, and waste. As Giro concludes, through the use of public visual space, i.e. parks like Magic Kingdom, Disney's network of power relations promotes the construction of an all-encompassing world of enchantment, allegedly free from ideology, politics, and power. That's in spite of the fact that political lobbying is the reason that Disney World was able to exist for so long as a self-governing independent special district. The park paints itself as a place of transcendence, of elevation beyond the mundanity of everyday life. Which brings us to stipulation five, so that the conceptions held by the group are taken as real. Now, we're obviously not saying that Disney adults literally wish upon stars or work hard at their jobs just because seven dwarves of various dispositions told them to. But Disney's grand narrative of spiritual uplift, moral truth, and endless nostalgia seems to be taken at face value or filtered through the fervor with which Disney adults express themselves. Disney adults may not pay Sadaka at the Temple of Tinkerbell, but one popular Disney World vacation tip site suggests that two adults have to cough up between $1,900 and $2,800 to visit Disney, which I'd call a healthy tithe. Meanwhile, according to the Washington Post, Disney continues to hike prices as much as 5-10% to each year, which is fine because wages go up at the same rate, right? That's how economics work. Viewing Disney World as a site for rites of passage, like weddings or bar and bat mitzvahs, cements the sense of faith fans have in the sanctity of its ethos. Now, let's return to stipulation number three, inculcating dispositions for behavior. What, if any sort of behavior, does the Disney empire encourage in its supplicants? You might be surprised, actually, that we haven't really brought it up yet. Starts with C, synonym for eat. That's right, consumption, and lots of it. As American Studies scholar Eric Smudin puts it, Disney constructs childhood so as to make it entirely compatible with consumerism. And it does so in the hopes of creating lifelong patrons of Disney entertainment and related products. Though it's not the only company to attempt such a feat, Missouri and Coda argue that because of its market penetration, its integrated marketing, and its access to many levels of culture through its corporate network, Disney is uniquely suited for the religification of its commodity. This is important because, as Jero notes, in our world of rapidly evolving mass communication, pop culture is a central way for young people to learn about themselves, their relationship to others, and the larger world. He argues that Disney is perfectly suited for a world where democracy has come to be less defined by civic engagement than by the freedom to consume freely and be entertained. Disney, he explains, prime children to relate to themselves as consumers before citizens, as individuals pursuing self-interest rather than members of communities pursuing any sort of collective good and then carry that self-perception into adulthood. Nowhere is this more evident than at Disney World, where, as Jero explains, consumption becomes the unifying force through which families organize themselves. Disney theme parks not only provide middle-class families with an upbeat version of the American past, they give such entertainment the force of civic duty. Encouraging spectatorship and passivity, Disney appropriates nostalgia simply to maximize consumption in the interest of fun and commerce. All at the side of Mickey Mouse popsicles, of course. Now, given Disney's ability to fulfill all five stipulations of Goethe's definition of religion, it's easy to conclude 
that it is in fact functioning like a religion, even if unintentional. But there's still a bit more to unpack. See, most religions ask us to sacrifice things in exchange for, say, salvation or God's good graces. We're supposed to give our money to houses of worship or charities, or spend part of our weekends in prayer, or deny ourselves the pleasure of red meat, or avoid masturbating so the Pope doesn't show up to our house and glue our palms to a cross. Religions also typically ask us to strive to abide by an ethical code and repent when we fail to do so. But Disney's pitch is a bit more simple. As Phil Vischer, co-founder of VeggieTales, persuasively argues, Disney has wrapped up and sold America what people wanted to hear, which was, give us the upside of religion without the obligation of religion. That is, like a lot of businesses, Disney offers us enlightenment through consumption without asking us to do any of the pesky self-examination that traditional religion might require. The difference is, they just happen to have a lot more power and, of course, a lot more real estate than most of the other people trying to sell you shit. At their parks, we can enjoy all the spiritual and ecstatic feeling of religious worship without having any of the moral or ethical responsibility that religion imposes upon us. Disney's ideology is ultimately pretty hollow. And yet, its cultural reach is so expansive, its appeals to childhood innocence so persuasive, that we can easily forget. It's not a value-driven benevolent entity striving to uplift its followers. It's a profit-driven multinational corporation. As Giroux puts it, innocence serves as a rhetorical device that cleanses the Disney image of the messiness of commerce, ideology, and power. That is to say, marketing itself as an institution in the business of enchantment can make you forget the immense and ever-growing chokehold over the entertainment industry. And it's obviously not just preaching the gospel of Mickey for fun. As Giroux furthers, that Disney has a political stake in creating a particular moral order favorable to its commercial interests raises questions about what it teaches. He argues that the lesson plans of the School of Disney ultimately reinforce an infantilized and privatized notion of citizenship. Disney probably isn't consciously trying to mimic religion, but its approach to converting acolytes can border on indistinguishable. Let us repeat. Disney is not trying to be a religion, but its tactics and the reception it receives from fans often takes on a spiritual tinge. Disney's interests are well served when people buy its products, but its interests are best served when a consumption-driven population is more concerned with having fun at Disney World than, say, with the labor rights of the workers making the park happen in the first place, or the company's serial cover-ups of sexual harassment and assault. In our cynical day and age, we all pretty much know that giant corporations basically never become giant corporations because they've done things in kind and magnanimous ways, no matter how cute their mascot is. And Disney is no different. While it's been hosting gay days since 1991 under the auspice of celebrating the queer community, it was also just recently busted for donating money to politicians who oppose queer rights. That includes Florida Republican Dennis Baxley, a career-long champion of anti-gay legislation and sponsor of the controversial Don't Say Gay Bill, which limits school teachers from mentioning anything queer-related in the classroom. While claiming to be a pride-friendly company, they've simultaneously been funding politicians who are actively harming the queer community. Now, after public outcry, Disney CEO Bob Chapek eventually spoke out against the bill, promising to be a better ally, and announced that the company was pausing political donations in Florida. Yet, concurrently, queer Pixar workers published a statement claiming that Disney higher-ups insisted they cut nearly every moment of overtly gay affection in their films suggesting the company's allyship remains suspect. And this is hardly the first of Disney's questionable political affiliations. They've also funded business groups who actively fight climate change legislation. And a recent report found that 69% of their political donations went to anti-abortion politicians. It's rainbow capitalism at its most insidious. Or take the time in 2013, as Disney was developing the movie Coco, when they tried to trademark the phrase Dia de los Muertos. This was part of Disney's gargantuan merchandising machine, which dates back to 1937 Snow White. You heard that right. In the lead up to the release of their groundbreaking celebration of Mexican culture, Disney tried to actively snatch the name of a sacred tradition out of the hands of the Mexican people across multiple media platforms. It's not good, team. It's not good. What's more, the values espoused in Disney films over the years 
can leave a foul taste in the mouth of a more progressive culture. From blatant racism to tired tropes of princesses being rescued by princes, Disney has long been a protector of white, heteronormative ideology, with much of the fantasy that makes it so appealing coming from a longing for an imagined past of greater simplicity. Despite Disney's attempts to keep its nostalgia apolitical, there's nonetheless a deeply political tinge to its evocation of a better time. Especially when you remember that in this romanticized past, many minority groups experienced profound discrimination. And while Disney is certainly getting better about depicting more diverse stories, it's hard to outrun its legacy, especially when those foundational films and park attractions remain so popular. So it looks like Disney has successfully used aspects of religion to maintain its cultural power, but that doesn't mean that it's intentionally built a religion. At the same time, it's the epitome of a capitalist institution and has always been most loyal to the creed of maximizing profits. So what exactly does that make it? That question, like the historic relationship between capitalism and religion in America, is more complicated than you might think. Dating back to the 16th century Christian missionaries who accompanied gold-hungry explorers on their excursions to the New World. Religious scholar Robert Lawrence Moore argues that religion has evolved alongside mass consumer culture out of necessity, increasingly commodifying along the way. He writes that religious influences established themselves in the forms of commercial culture that emerged in the 19th century, turning the United States into a flowering Eden of leisure industries by the middle of the 20th. Beginning with various sects mass-producing extensive religious reading materials, religions expanded their wares by entering radio and theater, and eventually television, via televangelists like Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, Pat Robertson, and Jimmy Swaggart. They expanded beyond halls of worship into nonprofits, athletic clubs like the YMCA, social halls, and so on. He explains that, by degrees, religion itself took on the shape of a commodity, as it looked for ways to appeal to all consumers, using the techniques of advertising and publicity. At the same time, religious institutions have been notably exempt from some of the governmental regulations and limitations of other markets. Moore notes, wryly, that flashy neon signs promising Jesus saves would never get churches in trouble for false advertising. After World War II, commodified religion poured into American culture at an unprecedented rate, and culture responded in like, with a proliferation of Hollywood blockbusters based on biblical stories. Around this time, America saw the beginnings of the megachurch, which according to scholar Scott Thuma, functioned like corporations, with the pastor as the often handsome and handsomely compensated CEO. They brand themselves like corporations too, by offering disparate, attractive forms of fun, performing arts, recreation activities, gyms, even movie theaters. And don't even get us started again on the enormous Christian music scene. And it wasn't just Christianity. From the 60s on, hundreds of new age religions flourished among free thinking boomers, almost always with economic tie-ins in the form of healing spas, crystals, and radio stations. In this way, as sociologist Peter L. Berger has observed, religious institutions become marketing agencies and the religious traditions become consumer commodities and a good deal of religious activity comes to be dominated by the logic of market economies. In recent years, as Missouri and Coda note, the line between religious activities and commercial activities has become increasingly blurry, with unexpected crossovers between the two realms and everything from Christian MLMs to Jewish dating sites. Increasingly, people like the fourth best Hollywood Chris will identify not as religious, but as spiritual, a term that is inherently looser and can be conducive to a sort of grab bag approach to spirituality. Mazur and Coda concur. Writing of Disney, they have entered the market at a time when many people are not only searching for alternatives to traditional religion, but are also flexible with what they find. So maybe the answer ultimately is that Disney is fulfilling functions of religion, such as religious institutions fulfill functions like fun and entertainment that are typically associated with Disney. So Disney's not necessarily becoming more like religion. Religion might just be becoming more like Disney. And nowhere is this bizarre paradox more apparent than at one of the country's many Jesus-themed parks. But then again, maybe we shouldn't see this as strange at all, because capitalism as an economic theory has actually never been totally free from religion. Philosopher Walter Benjamin famously said that, a religion may be discerned in capitalism. That is to say, capitalism serves essentially to ally the same anxieties, torments, and disturbances to which the so-called religions offered answers. Which basically means that capitalism isn't just an economic system. 
but a set of beliefs that aims to offer meaning and purpose to modern life. But rather than offering the hope, peace, and justice often promised by religion, according to Benjamin, capitalism is a religion which offers us not the reform of existence, but its complete destruction. It is the expansion of despair until despair becomes a religious state of the world in the hope that this will lead to salvation. In this context, all kinds of profit-driven institutions could be seen as doing something similar, i.e. offering their own solutions to problems previously thought to be the realm of religion. Whether you're preserving your Hello Kitty lunchbox behind a wall of glass, or worshiping at the altar of your favorite CrossFit instructor, praying with your model hot pastor at an evangelical megachurch, or spending your whole paycheck at Disney's Animal Kingdom, which, why, it's the saddest place in the world, because it's like a zoo, but there's there's no way they're taking care of it the same way you would take care of a zoo. It's really, it makes me feel bad. Don't go to Animal Kingdom. No matter what, just about every major institution you're engaging with is inevitably shining their lights towards the goodness of our one true God, capital. And as for Disney adults, are they part of a religion? Nah, not by our estimations. But are they an excellent example of the porousness between consumerism and spirituality that characterizes this moment in time? Almost certainly. But the good thing is, Unless you're the type of person who uses up all your yearly vacation days for trips to Anaheim and Orlando, you are in the clear. I guess unless um, you're really into Star Wars, because that's that's Disney now. Or if you've enjoyed the 29 or so MCU movies and the growing number of MCU TV shows, which are produced by Disney and available on Disney+. Plus. Um, but hey, if you're like a sports person, then you're good. Except for Disney owns ESPN, so every time you watch Stephen A. Smith lay down a hot take, you're still playing right into the those the hands of the mouse oh god um okay at least i still have my guilty pleasure the bachelor and its related properties which damn it they're on abc which is owned by disney too jesus christ or, or jesus mouse or, or mickey christ i don't even know anymore so maybe we're just all disney adults now whether we realize it or not but what do you think do you welcome your mouse eared overlord or do we still have a chance to eke out our own spiritual identities? Let us know in the comments. Um, thanks to our patrons for all your support. Be sure to check out our new patron perks if you haven't already. And be sure to check out our new stream Wisecrack Live that happens right here every Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific. Smash that subscribe button like it's a bell jar protecting the enchanted rose keeping you alive. And don't forget to ring that bell. Be sure to like this video unless it's inspired you to write hate mail. And as always, thanks for watching. Later.